Ladies and gentlemen, we will start um, this press conference with the title Keeping Europe on the Map in an Ever More Competitive World. Um, we have very distinguished guests here who will talk about this topic. Um, I will introduce them in order of the seating and then we will start um, talking about this topic. I have um, to my left uh, Professor Jean-Pierre Bourguignon, um, President of the European Research Council. Um, then we have um, Carlos Muedas, um, who is the European Commission, um, Commissioner for Research, Science and Innovation at the European Commission. And um, we have Professor Sir Christopher Pissarides, who's a Nobel Laureate um, in Economic Science, also at the European Research Council uh, grantee. So um, I would like to ask first Mr. Muedas, um, the European Commissioner, to start with a few remarks, um, followed um, by, by our other guests on, on the panel, and then we will open the floor for some questions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for all for being here. Uh, first of all, let me tell you that it's a, a real pleasure uh, to be actually uh, sitting here uh, with one Nobel laureate and another Nobel laureate <laughs> just sitting there in front of me. And both of them are sirs. So uh, apart from being professors, sirs, they are Nobel laureates. And um, I feel very humbled by, by that. And of course, with Professor Bourguignon, um, a man who has done and is doing a fantastic job at uh, the European Research Council. I think that I'll start by saying that uh, the professors and I shared the opinion that fundamental visionary research is vital for our future prosperity in Europe and in the world. Science and research undertaken by front runners and emerging leaders in their field, creating knowledge, exploring new parameters, conjuring the scientific technological breakthroughs that improve our lives give rise to new businesses, opportunities, and greatly increase our global competitiveness. The European Research Council is a research funding body set up by the EU not too long ago. It was in 2007. Since then, it has funded some of the most brilliant, new, and tested minds around the world. We have here ERC grantees and Nobel laureates that know what I'm talking about, enabling them to conduct their cutting edge work in Europe. The ERC is part of the EU funding program for research, science and innovation called Horizon 2020. Horizon 2020 is our biggest tool, is the biggest public research budget to date, and it's the biggest program in the world. The ERC has received around 13 billion euros for the period of 2014 to 2020. ERC funding has proven to be an invaluable asset for Europe. The ERC has supported, as of today, around 4,300 research principles of 64 different nationalities located in 600 research performing establishments in 30 countries in Europe and associated countries so far, providing grants to the people whose discoveries can start new industries, new markets, and improve our quality of life. The ERC curiosity-driven competitive approach has enabled it to fund a broad portfolio of research including projects which address the grand challenges as well as fundamental questions faced by European and global society. Like the Norwegian husband and wife team of Professor May Britt and Edward Moser, 2014 Nobel Prize winning discovery of proof of the human brain's inner navigation system. Like Graphene, and we have the great pleasure to have here the man that was actually part of actually that great and amazing discovery. To keep our economy competitive, we must remain at the forefront of research, science, and innovation. 
and to remain at the <coughs> forefront of research, science and innovation, we must keep encouraging our researchers to take risks. Only by enabling our top talent to explore the unknown can we stretch the limits of the understanding and breaking new ground. For every project and attempt that is unsuccessful, there is still the further opportunity to learn from what went wrong. Europe needs to encourage its thinkers and risk takers. Secured funding in the form of grants frees researchers from concerns about the immediate impact of their work, multiple grant applications and pressures to publish. It allows especially young emerging leaders to really focus on their core research. <coughs> to advance as a competitive global partner, we need the world's best to make Europe their laboratory. To make Europe the destination of choice for the world's most groundbreaking scientists, research and innovators. Thank you very much and uh, I'm <coughs> really willing for your questions and now I'll pass on yeah. to the moderator. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner. Um, now I will um, give um, the floor to uh, Sir, uh, Professor Sir Pisaridis to add <coughs> his um, <coughs> thoughts about that. Thank you very much. Well, in the last few days, as you probably realize, we, our concern was about very, very short-term issues, like what's the ECB going to do, how many billions of euros is it going to spend, and all that. And, and, and it's understandable, given what we're going through, especially for someone of Greek background, it's, it's twice understandable, <laughs> given the elections we're having on Sunday. But ultimately, what's going to bring recovery to Europe and what's going to drive our future economic growth is, is technology. It's the innovation, technology, application, productivity, because we live in an open world, and the only way you, you can compete in an open world is uh, new technological innovation, new productivity, uh, drivers within a stable macroeconomic environment. We, we've been putting too much emphasis on the macroeconomic environment recently, but we mustn't forget that basically, and especially as scientists, when we go uh, back home and, and, do, and, and do take note that I'm calling myself a scientist, although some people call me a dismal economist a few days ago, yesterday. Um, not me personally, of course, I understand. And, um, that ultimately, that's what we spend most of our time, and that's what we're looking for. Now, <clears throat> when when you are at a stage of um, of, of not uh, high educational standards or um, advanced in your economic development, you might think, "Oh, well, it's easy enough. Why don't I copy what the frontier countries are doing?" In our case, let's face it, it's the United States. You know. But for Europe, it's not good enough to say, why don't we copy the United States? We, we've, we've got to innovate ourselves. I mean, we cannot uh, just be followers uh, throughout. We've got a highly educated uh, labor force. We've got mature countries. We've got <coughs> good universities. Uh, we can produce wealth. We shouldn't ignore it, and we, and we should be moving uh, forward all the time, especially now that uh, countries like uh, China started putting in, in a lot in, into research, competition will intensify. Now, the, <clears throat> the, the Horizon 2020 program, of course, it's, uh, it, it, it's an excellent program. You know, if you ask me, are you happy? Well, I, I would be even happier if I had more to spend than, than what it has, but then is there any limit to that? The answer is no. Um, it, don't, don't forget that um, Lisbon, 2000 said that within 10 years we were going to overtake the United States in technology, and, and we didn't, and we should try harder this time. Um, uh, remember also that um, it's not only discovery that, that matters, you know, discovering new great things like graphene from my colleague here. We spent a wonderful week together in uh, Stockholm in 2010. Um, Quite justifiably, they were in the limelight, and we followed behind because that's the that's the fate of economists in in the mind of Mr. Alfred Nobel. But we can't complain; at least we are there. <laughs> and um, you know, that the great discoveries like that. But we should also be concerned about implementation and 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 learning how to implement the things we are discovering in Europe. Also needs research. In fact. In fact, we lost some quite famous European discoveries to the United States and. Uh, 
and, and big American uh, companies because we, we didn't have the right market environment and the right incentives to uh, I implement them in Europe. <clears throat> so remember that when we're talking funding, we're talking about discovery, about how to uh, use those for the benefit of the of the people as a whole, not just for the benefit of um, of uh, publications in uh, path-breaking papers, which are then taken up by someone else. And remember also that there is um, a human side to it. <coughs> As an economist, I have to emphasize it. There is an employment side. We want the um, I the innovation and the, and the new technology to be inclusive. How do we bring in everyone to benefit from it and not uh, just a few? And this is where we, the economists, are coming in, and in particular the uh, research project that the uh, European Research Council is, is funding, which I'm uh, supervising now, is, is exactly about that. Where are the jobs going to come from in the, the new digital age? If we have automation, what are the people going to do that uh, they're going to lose those jobs? We had a session here uh, on the first day, in fact, that um, was quite illuminating when I uh, when I saw it because there were the people, uh, the CEOs from high tech companies, saying, uh, "Well, you know, they had to shut down so many jobs. Technology will eat up so many jobs." And there was general concern: where are those people going to go? Well, that's the whole question of of inclusiveness, and that's what the ERC is generously funding uh, through um, through one of my universities. My university. <laughs> Um, and um, I, I, the only thing I would say, I see that I've, I've run out of time, the only thing I would say is that um, congratulations for the good work and, and please carry on. And next time we meet here, I hope it's 20% uh, more than now, <laughs> <laughs> the funding that we have. <laughs> thank, thank, you. thank you very much, uh, sir. Um, I will um, hand over to Professor uh, Bourguignon from um, the European Research Council for his thoughts. Thank you very much. So I'm very pleased to be here. I mean, sitting next to Commissioner Moedas and to Sir Christopher. Uh, and also, I'm very pleased that some uh, ERC grantees are in the room. I could, uh, in particular, uh, um, thank uh, the uh, World Economic Forum to have been given an opportunity to have a number of ERC grantees here participating. My point uh, as uh, pr president of ERC is really to, to really give you uh, uh, really a, an idea of uh, how the Scientific Council, which is really a uh, quite unique uh, situation in the program of the European Commission, has been given the power of uh, deciding how to spend the amount of money which is given to its disposal, which is very significant, and also how to organize the evaluation, because we are talking here about a program which really selects a project, and of course the very key issue is uh, who is doing the selection. And uh, we are very pleased that I think we, it, uh, we have been able, and because the scientific community is very convinced of the importance of the ERC, to really uh, get in our panels really some of the leading scientists. So I think uh, we need to keep this uh, situation, that is to convince the best scientists to participate in the evaluation. And I think the, when I talk to them, clearly what is the main reason why they agree to do that, because they are participating in discussions at a very high level, and they are confronted with projects at a very high level. So this is really this intellectual stimulation and the feeling they are participating in something which is going to change the science uh, altogether that really motivate them to come. And I know it's hard work, but that's really a very key element. So the, that, that was my first point, that is the responsibility which is given to the Scientific Council, which is uh, unique, actually, in the European Commission. And we are very grateful of the, of the confidence that has been the trust that we have uh, been uh, given. The, the other point I want to make, which uh, for me is also very important as president, is that ERC is really addressing uh, knowledge very broadly. That is, we, we don't uh, introduce barriers between uh, various disciplines. Uh, we have uh, 25 panels because we have to organize the evaluation in some way. Uh, and uh, definitely for us, uh, we want to go from uh, mathematics, which is uh, PE1, uh, physics engineering one, up to social sciences and humanities. So we really cover uh, the physics, physics engineering, uh, and uh, on one hand, life sciences on the other hand, and also social sciences and humanities. So we really want, we cover everything. And it's very important that we have this ability, because among the projects, we have more and more of these projects which actually touch different things. So pluridisciplinarity at the initiative of the scientists is something which is more and more on the map. And I think we have to organize ourselves to really recognize this 
its dis interdisciplinarity and really to evaluate uh, properly. The other point I want to make, which has been the choice of the Scientific Council and a very consistent choice, that is we repeatedly the choice has been made because, as I said, the Scientific Council has a responsibility of uh, saying how it, uh, it will spend the money to put the main emphasis on young people. So the programs we have are three levels. One level is two to seven years after PhD, seven to 12 years after PhD, and then uh, so-called advanced grants without limitation. And two-thirds of the money goes to younger people. So it means that two-thirds of the people we're actually funding are between 30 and 40. And we know it's a very critical stage for scientists. When they become independent, they can develop their own team, and we know how critical it is and also the fact that the funding is for five years, it begins really people, um, really some kind of a possibility to really think big and to really be ambitious. And that's really exactly what, uh, how we push people. And actually they have to be ambitious because the competition is very tough and uh, it's only about the success rate is about 10%, which is not so much. And I think uh, as a result, I mean, uh, the, the people who get supported, uh, and that's what I hear from the scientific community everywhere, these people are really distinguished by their, I mean, the quality of the project they are pushing. So this is very, very critical. So as uh, Commissioner Moedash said, uh, of course, the, uh, the, the importance of the program that the European Commission is putting forward to support science is, of course, not unrelated, and I'm using an understatement to state that, to the uh, competitiveness from the economic point of view of, uh, of, of Europe. And that's why, uh, and one component which didn't escape the Scientific Council, this is why we have a so-called proof of concept program which accompanies the ERC grantees, the people who receive support from ERC, so already very distinguished scientists, when they feel that along the way of their research, they can branch off to something which is more connected to market or something more connected to, a, to, an, uh, to really a societal challenge. And this uh, program is more and more successful. Actually, we have more and more candidates. And at the moment where ERC is giving more or less almost 1,000 contracts per year, um, actually we have uh, basically, uh, we have already 100 uh, proof of concept co contract per year. So it shows that uh, really the scientists are, I mean, a number of scientists see the possibility for their work to branch off to something else. We know that the amount of money we put at the disposal on top of the usual amount they have is not so much, but actually one thing we can witness now is that receiving support for the proof of concept is a fantastic uh, element for people when they want to create a startup or so on because it shows that uh, they have already been able to come up with a business, uh, business plan which is really uh, seen as uh, viable by professional people. The people who evaluate this proof of concept are not scientists, they're really people who are professional valorization. And so uh, I, I mention this because uh, even if the amount of money is not so huge, but because I think it shows that uh, the Scientific Council, who is I mean, making its decisions strictly on scientific grounds, of course, uh, is completely conscious of the dimension of uh, competitiveness of Europe. And of course, the, the critical competitiveness is uh, really to keep in Europe or to attract in Europe back for some of them or just to attract the, them to Europe for good some of the very best scientists in the world. So this is really what it is about. And actually, it's amazing to see the number of uh, grantees that uh, actually we have been able to brought back to the US, typically, who, who saw that the best possibility for, for them to develop their research was in Europe and also some, some uh, of the best young people from outside. Just to give an example about China, we have at the moment uh, only eight Chinese uh, grant holders but we have more than 700 Chinese in the teams that are financed by ERC. And some of the very best young Chinese are actually part of these teams. So it shows the capacity of such a program to have a transformative effect. And the transformation, and I'm coming to my end, is really um, uh, in two ways. The first way, of course, is the, the fact that the researchers are really pushed to be ambitious, to submit really very ambitious projects. And uh, this is very important. So it's not just uh, money uh, as usual just to get your work do I mean, going on. You know that to achieve an ERC grant, you really have to propose something really uh, ambitious. That's what makes the difference. And the second point is also transformative on institutions. Because now uh, ERC has become a reference, which is something quite remarkable in such a short period of time. We're just eight years old as an institution. And really now uh, getting ERC grants is really a criteria for, uh, for institutions to prove that they're really on the map. 
And uh, of course, it means uh, this very tough competition um, means that there are some winners and some losers. So I hope the losers learn lessons from the winners. And actually, some of the winners are willing to share the experience they have had. And I think it's um, this tra transformative effect of uh, creating an element of dynamics in the European scientific establishment is very, very important. So this is uh, where I want to stop. My last point, of course, is uh, remember always Europe is a complicated structure in the sense that, of course, the input uh, of the European Commission is very important. In the case of ERC, it has been absolutely decisive, I think, in terms of the competitiveness of science in Europe. But the countries have also to do their share. And actually, as president, that's one of my duties, which is to talk to the ministers and to convince them that they cannot tell, well, if you're good enough, you, have, you get your money from, from the ERC. Actually, the countries have to do their share, and they have to also have their program. So we have seen, because of the crisis, a number of countries actually cut, and in some cases, quite badly on the research uh, budget. This has not been the case of the European Commission, which has really committed a very substantial budget for, for research. But uh, Europe is really a combination of uh, the work of the European Commission and the work of the countries. And we need to find the proper dynamics for this. And this is the way I think uh, I, I view my own contribution as president, namely in between the two. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, we have uh, time for uh, a few questions. Um, if you have a question, would you please introduce yourself uh, and wait for the microphone since this is a live webcast um, and so that our, our audience on the webcast can also uh, listen to your question. So please, any questions in the room? Yes, there are two, one here and one over there. Yes, can we start here, please? Thank you. Uh, Luca Fazzani from the Swiss Public Radio. Uh, for Professor Bourguignon, uh, Professor Pissarida said uh, we can't just copy the US in innovations. Uh, is that so bad? Is that today's situation, according to you? Well, I think uh, there are, as you know, for innovation, there are several components. The com first component, of course, the, is the intellectual input, the fact that you have something that you see can really have an impact as a, you can have a new product, you can have a new process, and, uh, and for, to do that, of course, you need uh, very often some, uh, from the scientific point of view, some new input. But of course, you need the uh, people who are able to make the connection, the translators, the people who create this link. And for, for this uh, point of view, I think Europe has not been as good as Silicon Valley or other places. So I think, uh, but you should be aware that if you want this to happen, you cannot just uh, say, I'm going to get the ideas from the US or from China, and then we are going to develop it uh, in Europe. I think at the moment, we have, uh, in particular in the younger generation, a very dynamic group of scientists, and we need to accompany them in their efforts to, when they are interested to do that themselves, in their effort to go to more closer to markets. But then if they are not interested themselves to do it, we have to develop the right people and the right structures, the right schemes to have this done. So I think that's the situation presently, but it's true at this moment that Europe is lagging behind in terms of this I mean, translation or this uh, innovation of the whole uh, industrial, um, I mean, uh, industrial sector by new ideas, by innovation. Thank you very much, Professor. Commissioner, I think you want to add something to that. Even if the question was not uh, uh, for me, but uh, I wanted just to uh, help uh, here on, on uh, Professor Bourguignon's point and uh, on Professor Pisiradis, which is that uh, I've, I've told quite often that uh, Europe. Uh, is excellent at transforming euros into knowledge, but eventually not as good as transforming that knowledge into euros, meaning into products. And I think that uh, that comes from uh, the need in Europe for a, a broader view of innovation. Uh, innovation uh, is and sometimes starts by an invention, but innovation doesn't stop in the invention. Innovation is much broader than that. And so we are lucky because in Europe we are today the flagship of fundamental and curiosity research of the world. So we have the raw material. I mean, we are 7% of the world and we produce 30% of the knowledge. But then you have to do that step and that step actually involves looking at innovation of processes, innovation of business plans, of design, and all these features that actually transform and get to the chain of the process from the fundamental to actually the product. And uh, it's absolutely a crucial point uh, for Europe.
Thank you very much, Commissioner. We had another question here on the left side. Yes, hello, Blessig from Agence France Presse. I had, would like to ask a question to Sir Pissarides. I wanted to know, in the presentation, you said you have some ideas to lowering unemployment in Europe. Could you just elaborate <coughs> on it, please? Uh, yes, I, I'll try to be brief because we are running out of time, but um, I could be talking until tomorrow about that issue if, <laughs> if you want me to. The, um, the, the ideas and what we're working on on, <coughs> on the project, what we started working on and then received uh, the funding to work on is uh, how to uh, help create jobs that at the lower end of the skills dis distribution, if you like, because where unemployment is high is where uh, skills are, are, are absent. Now, normally, you hear people saying, well, the way to deal with that is to upgrade the skills. So upgrade skills and go up and up. But the problem is that is that there is demand and there will be increasing demand for uh, people to um, do jobs that do not really require te technical skills. They, they, the, the main skills that they will require will be skills on, uh, on human contact, you know, how to, you deal with other people. The, the best examples uh, maybe are health healthcare workers. You know, as our population is aging and as our standards of living are rising, we have more demand for health services and we have more demand for care, not not strictly medical, uh, highly qualified medical services, but but care itself, which normally in in poorer societies, if you like, is taken by lying in bed and feeling miserable for two or three days until you recover. Nowadays, we have demands that people will need to look after you. How do you make sure that those jobs are respectable, well compensated jobs, so that more and more people will be doing it? We haven't been good at that in in Europe. With the exception of the Scandinavian countries, um, we haven't been creating enough jobs of that kind, and there is demand that goes unsatisfied. Another kind of demand that, as um, as as, the, as progress is taking place, as time is getting more limited, and again with aging, we would expect better retail service, for example, in our, in, in our shops. Um, in in Europe, we do wait much longer in 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 queues. Uh, to get served in a shop or to pay than in the United States, for example. Uh, now, the United States has succeeded in creating that kind of job by tolerating uh, high levels of inequality. You know, those people are working at minimum wage when top wages rise more and more. In Europe, we haven't been uh, tolerant of that. We've introduced institutions and, uh, and, and regulations that, um, uh, that are not conducive to the creation of that type of job. It, the, the, the outcome in terms of pay is, uh, is less inequality, which is good, but then it's bad in terms of job creation, and that's uh, one of the reasons that we're having such high youth unemployment rates. Again, we're working on, on ideas how to make sure that that type of job is, is created and is more respectable and people feel proud that they're doing it well compensated, and at the same time they provide the service to the, um, mm -hmm. to, to the people that require it. So I think those mm -hmm. two examples will suffice. We'll stop there because we're moving on to 11 o'clock. <laughs> okay. We, I mean, normally we, we are running out of time, but uh, we, if there is another question here, uh, we will take that. Yes, please. Thank you very much, Marcel Andrewert, Swiss Public TV, for Mr. Pissaridis yes, again. Sorry. <coughs> um, I just wanted to ask you one question um, referring to the elections, to tomorrow's elections in Greece. <laughs> okay. no, um, yes. From your economic vantage point, what, mm. what are the, the biggest risks for Greece and the European Union, in your opinion? <laughs> well, it's not quite an e e ERC or a, or a research question, but I'll answer very, very briefly. For, for, me, for me, the bigger risk is the breakdown of communication and um, what our European... Uh, uh, commissioners and leaders cross solidarity. Uh, that, that's my, that's my fear that that will start that will move into an antagonistic environment that uh, that will make the situation worse. We 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 had a very cooperative, um, solida solidarity driven, if you like, approach to European integration until the recession of 2008 and, and especially the debt crisis of 2010. Then um, relations within. Uh, the Eurozone didn't quite go as uh, smoothly as before. We started having debtors and creditors and arguments and you give me this, I give you that, blah, blah, blah. And then we um, we are improving now and, and we're getting back to cooperation and, and that's why I hailed with so much enthusiasm the decision of the European Central Bank uh, yesterday, which was a Eurozone decision looking at the Eurozone as a whole and not individual uh, countries. 
and the biggest fear I have, in my view, the biggest risk is that we're going to regress in, in that, no, not we're going to, I fear in case we regress in that kind of um, convergence back to a cooperative approach to our problems in Europe. And, and, and I'm hoping that what uh, we're hearing in the pre-election campaigns is just electioneering and once a new government is in, forgets about those things and realizes that unless we cooperate in Europe, we're, especially the Eurozone, we're just, we're all going to suffer and we're going to go backwards. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, otherwise, you can develop maybe after the press conference in, in, in an interview. Um, Commissioner, do you want to add on, anything on uh, before we conclude? Yeah. Yes, I, I just would probably go back uh, to the question of unemployment, uh, because I think it's a crucial uh, question for Europe. And uh, when you look at unemployment and you look at the solutions for Europe, the solution is to be more productive. And to be more productive, you have three ways. One is that you actually work more for the same amount of money. The other one is that you actually work the same for less money. Or the third, which is the way that the European Commission has chosen, is that you get more up into the innovation ladder, that you create better products, that you can sell to more people in different markets, and you can pay better your employees, the people that create those businesses, and that you are better off, and that the society is better off. And that's why the agenda of science, research, and innovation is the answer for that problem in the medium and the long term. And so you have, in one way, you have to actually do the right structural reforms in Europe, and uh, Professor Pisaridis referred to it, that Europe is still fragmented and you have to actually do those reforms in different countries, uh, from the labor market to the product market to the judicial market. You have to do those reforms. And then you have to invest in actually getting businesses to create products and better products and to go up in this ladder of innovation. And so uh, there's no magic bullet. And, and sometimes you feel that uh, people uh, think that there would be a magic bullet. But at national level or at the European level, you actually have to work in these two parts, which are really what will change Europe. The structural reforms in one side, to have a market, uh, internal market that works uh, in the labor end of the product side, and on the other side, keep investing in uh, science and innovation. And, and I think that's uh, the two points uh, that will actually take us to the future if we are actually winning this battle uh, in, in Europe. So, uh, but absolutely, the crucial question. Professor Bourguignon, do, do you want to say a few concluding yeah, just, words? Well, <laughs> as, as conclusion, um, well, maybe two points. Uh, the first point, I think, uh, which is, uh, has been for me since I took office a year ago, uh, fantastic uh, experience has been to, to meet uh, ERC grantees and uh, to see how much they, their energy, their ambition, and uh, also, for many of them, how often they told me, without this support, I would not have been able to do the research I'm doing now. And also some of them telling me, if this had not happened, I would not be there. I would be elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So it's a very, very important message. And the second one, which I think has to do with the, uh, the, the relation that uh, the ERC is uh, having with the other programs of the European Commission. Of course, uh, we are very, very conscious of the uh, responsibility which has been given to the Scientific Council to really, uh, for example, decide how to spend the money and how to, to organize the evaluation. But I feel that uh, this, uh, this responsibility, I hope we, people outside consider we are doing it uh, in the right way. But for me, uh, for the future, I really count on uh, very close cooperation with uh, Commissioner Moedas, and he knows that it's not just here that I see this. And uh, therefore, we, uh, we really the, I would really like that uh, we contribute uh, to the global uh, efforts of um, the, the Directorate General to which we are, in a sense, attached, although we have some independence, in the most efficient way and uh, the most uh, positive and cooperative way. So this is, uh, for me, this collaboration is very, very important. And I think uh, the fact that we are having this conference, press conference together, is one first sign, but I hope there will be many others. Absolutely.
Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to, to the audience and to our panelists for this press conference. Thank you.